Hello, my name is Kent Wong. I'm the director of the UCLA Labor Center, and I'd like to welcome you to week seven of our class with Reverend James Lawson Jr. on nonviolence and social movements. And today we are very honored to be joined by our very good friend, Senator Maria Elena Durazo. The work between Senator Durazo and Reverend Lawson had a transformational impact on Senator Durazo's prior union, the Hotel Workers Local 11, but indeed their work together helped to transform the Los Angeles labor movement. Welcome, Senator Durazo. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much, Reverend Lawson. Good to see you again, always. <laughs> I'll uh, launch today's class with a uh, very short slideshow that highlights some of the extraordinary work of Maria Elena Durazo and the Hotel Workers Local 11 and her partnership with Reverend Lawson that date, dates back many years. So I hope you enjoy this brief slideshow. So this is on nonviolence and the transformation of the Los Angeles labor movement, the story of Maria Elena Durazo and Unite Here Local 11, the hotel workers. Maria Elena Durazo's breakthrough election back in 1989 to become president of the hotel workers not only shook up the hotel workers union, it had a huge impact on the Los Angeles labor movement overall. And this is an article from the Los Angeles Times that leads, organizer wins post of president, Latina leads takeover of union from Anglo males. Maria Elena recruited her good friend, Reverend James Lawson Jr. to teach the union about the philosophy of nonviolence. And uh, there is Reverend Lawson at the podium and Maria Elena by his side. From Memphis to Los Angeles, the slogan, I am a man and I am a human being resonated. And his, here is a group of hotel workers with the sign, I am a human being. And the handheld sign says, el presente es la lucha, el futuro es nuestro. The, the current situation is the struggle, the future is ours. Miguel Contreras came to Los Angeles to help to rebuild the hotel workers local 11. He was actually one of the trustees that ran the second election that successfully seated Maria Elena as president of local 11. Miguel Contreras and Maria Elena Durazo helped to transform the Los Angeles labor movement. Miguel Contreras went on to become the first person of color to ever lead the Los Angeles labor movement and he relied heavily on the leaders of the Hotel Workers Union Local 11 to lead in that transformation process. Unite Here Local 11 impacted the national AFL-CIO. And when the AFL-CIO convention came to town, there was Maria Elena Durazo on the front lines in the middle next to current president, Richard Trumka. Next to him was former president, John Sweeney, and next to him is Linda Chavez Thompson, the first woman of color to hold a top officer position within the LA, within the AFL-CIO. And Maria Elena began the process of building union power through organizing. And there she uh, is uh, giving a, a, a workshop on, uh, for her um, union leaders. Who's got the power? and talking about the importance of building union density within the hotel industry of Los Angeles. Here's a photo of Maria Elena negotiating with the police. And uh, the uh, uh, Local 11 did path-breaking work in, uh, in setting up pickets and setting up rallies in engaging in various civil disobedience actions, which inevitably resulted in uh, co confrontations with the uh, police and sheriffs and security. Here is a photo of a major civil disobedience action that was led by uh, the Hotel Workers Local 11 
And Reverend Lawson was frequently called in to prepare civil disobedience training for the staff and members of Local 11. And uh, sometimes they were, they were very theatrical events. Here was a demonstration at a downtown hotel in Los Angeles where the workers took over the intersection during rush hour and the uh, hotel uh, cleaners uh, brought out beds and made the beds in the middle of the streets and the uh, hotel servers brought food out to serve the crowd and, and they brought the, um, the tools of their trade and they wore their uniforms into the streets as part of that civil disobedience action. Here's a photo of hotel workers getting arrested and uh, you see the uh, expression of the hotel workers who uh, had a spirit of determination, of power, of understanding that they were making history by taking these bold steps. Unite Here Local 11 was at the forefront of leading the fight for immigrant rights. And this was in many uh, instances a controversial initiative where the rest of the labor movement was not behind them with regard to the embrace of the struggle for immigrant workers and the demand for full rights for undocumented immigrants. At the largest May Day demonstration in US history, Maria Elena was one of the co-MCs when hundreds of thousands of immigrant workers took to the streets and she introduced Reverend Lawson who spoke at that rally who declared no human being is illegal. Maria Elena launched the immigrant worker freedom ride along with the leaders of Hotel 11, once again, with the counsel of Reverend Lawson who joined her uh, at the uh, rally in uh, back East at the culmination of the 3000 mile immigrant worker freedom ride. And they went throughout the South and connected with many of the leaders of the struggle for freedom from decades past and built unity between the immigrant workers movement and the movement for um, freedom and justice that had preceded this activity decades before. Unite Here Local 11 helped lead the fight for political power and to uh, mobilize their communities to turn out to vote in record numbers. Maria Elena then went on to become the first woman of color to ever lead the Los Angeles County Federation of Labor and the 800,000 union members. And she went on to become elected to state senator. And I was so uh, thrilled when I saw her uh, signs throughout Los Angeles that said, disobey Trump. Maria Elena Durazo for state senator, the first time she ever ran for elected office, she won. And now she has emerged as a champion for the rights of workers throughout the state of California and continues to do so to this day. So uh, we are so grateful to have you with us, uh, Senator Durazo. And the first question is, if you could please tell me about your own history um, as a, a, a person from a farm worker family and what motivated you to become an activist and how you first met Reverend Lawson. Well, thank you, Kent. Um, I, um, I'm glad we started with, with what sort of led me to uh, doing this kind of work. And certainly the conditions in which our family worked in, we were migrant farm workers. So we went from crop to crop to crop from town to town to town, you know, a couple of times a year to different different towns. And, uh, you know, the term homelessness, homeless was not the term that people used back then. Uh, you know, this was in the 50s and the 60s. Um, so, but we were, we were many times unable to pay rent of a home, of an apartment anywhere. So we lived in tents. Uh, or we lived in flatbed trucks. I was number seven, child number seven of 11, what were eventually 11 kids. Um, and our whole experience was that of, we counted on our whole family because we were our friends. We were, we were our own circle of friends. Uh, we didn't stay long enough to make friends uh, and keep them through the years. Uh, but we all worked side by side with each other. Um, my father would negotiate the best deal he could, uh, considering some of us were really young um, and uh, we were kind of his crew. But uh, clearly, clearly the growers took full advantage of us, of 
um, childhood, you know, working, working in the fields as, as small children and not making enough to put a roof over our heads, many times not making enough to buy uh, the food that we needed to, to feed ourselves. But my father had, and my parents had a very strong work ethic and you're gonna work and work and we're gonna do everything we can to support our family uh, by working. And so certainly those things, you know, I lost a, uh, an infant brother uh, because we were unable to get him to the doctor when we lived in the in the San Jose area uh, in, a, in, in the tents. So uh, there was a lot of pain, but there was a lot of happiness. There was a lot of trust and belief. We had values. My parents raised us um, uh, very, very in, in the faith of, uh, of Catholicism, but to me, uh, they didn't read the Bible to us every night. What they did was they showed through their actions what our faith was all about. You mm. know, helping people who were poorer than us, that seems kind of impossible, but my dad did. So I think those were the, the first, the foundation of uh, what later be led me to become an activist. The, the anger at the injustices, but the love of people like my family and my and my parents. Um, I couldn't believe that I actually got to meet Reverend Lawson uh, back in the day. I was I was an organizer, but we really needed a lot of help because we didn't want to be a traditional union for business, sort of business unionism. We wanted to be a movement. And we knew that including immigrants with the broader uh, labor movement would give it power. And our best, um, our best example was the farm workers movement. It was about creating a union for workers, but it was also about a movement that was much, much, much bigger. And um, we needed help in doing that. And so I got connected with Reverend Lawson and uh, we started this whole 25 year plus uh, relationship uh, where he went little by little taught me and taught our whole union uh, what were the most important elements of building a movement, a nonviolent movement. Thank you, um, Maria Elena. Um, Reverend Lawson, uh, you had done extraordinary work uh, with the um, uh, AFSCME union during the Memphis Sanitation Workers' Strike. We had an earlier session with uh, Bill Lucy, your good friend. and. Um, uh, when you came to Los Angeles, the Hotel Workers was one of the first unions uh, that you really uh, worked very closely with uh, for an extended period of time to introduce the philosophy of nonviolence. Uh, what approach did you take uh, to um, work with Maria Elena and to work with the um, staff and leaders of the Hotel Workers? Well, actually, I took a rather, for me, normative approach. Uh, I'll never forget the day in my office that I, uh, at home in the United Methodist Church, when the phone rang and it was Maria Elena de Rosso, um, her presidency of Local 11 was firmly established, and she said that we, uh, I don't remember the exact conversation, but she said, we want, I want you to see I want to ask you to come and teach us nonviolent struggle, methodology, and resistance. So uh, I said yes to that. Of course, I was elated. <laughs> Union saying we're going to organize around nonviolent tactics and and fierce uh, commitment to change and to justice. So my uh, our our first agreement was we we. She brought together her executive committee, as I recall, and a number of uh, organizers in the union. And we went through the basic elements of a nonviolent philosophy, non nonviolent history, nonviolent strategy, and tactics. I tried basically, as I recall, to uh, uh, organize the kind of workshops I did uh, with Martin Luther King Jr. in 58 
with the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, with the Nashville campaign, the Birmingham campaign, and the Little Rock Nine, to, to give them an awareness of uh, our wrestling with an ancient tradition of resistance that did not get written up in the books as a subject matter, but rather as episodic <laughs> biographical <laughs> event, uh, events and people. But a history now, of course, that is more and more appearing, appearing in major documents. And so uh, I don't remember how long we ran that first series of workshops. Um, but um, that began a very keen relationship and uh, indeed, and I'm just uh, deeply pleased that Maria Elena and I crossed paths and that Local 11 did the good work that they did and that are still, are still doing. I recently did a, um, a one day group with local 11 staff. There were about a hundred people there. Well, back in the mid eighties when Marie and Lena started, I don't think there were any near near a hundred. We, <laughs> it's a relatively small executive committee, relatively small number of organizers. So that's how, how much growth uh, uh, the, the uh, local 11 has done and, and then transferred to that to many other people. And the other thing that I was interested in, I, in that one day session was I asked them, what kind of union are you? And it was unanimous. We are a justice union. <laughs> they said from all over the room came, we're a justice union. We're, work, we're working on the issue of building a union that affects change around all the issues that affects our members and their families. So that, that, was, that was a wonderful uh, day when uh, 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 just a handful of years ago. That uh, partnership and friendship uh, that has extended for the past 30 years indeed was transformational, not only for Local 11, but for the Los Angeles labor movement. I still remember that you would gather a group of us, uh, Reverend Lawson, uh, at Holman, uh, it was yes, the Holman group. That's right. Uh -huh. and, uh, a number of uh, uh, emerging uh, uh, young troublemakers uh, would uh, have conversations with you on a regular basis and uh, learn from you and to uh, engage in conversation with you. It was so transformational to uh, so many of us. And um, we learned from each other. Yes. I mean, that was very important. And because it seems to me anyway that that movements that want to bring about a better world, a better city, it must be movements to really gain benefits of, of learning from one another and from other people, because that then strengthens us in our awareness of the issues and also then enables us to, to do basic reflection on how we can move better, more strategically to get the work done and to do the work. I have, I have that's now a very strong. That's now a very strong element in the labor movement in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. I have I have very fond memories of those conversations and how it was uh, a mutual uh, safe space to share yeah, lessons right. and to strategize together on how to be more effective at uh, making change. So, Maria hey. Elena, how did you first come to embrace? the philosophy of nonviolence and what are some of the influences that led you on this path? Well, I, I, you know, I, the real memories I have of specific influences were uh, when I was in high school, my next older brother uh, was going to Fresno State. We lived in, in the Central Valley mm -hmm. and he uh, got very involved in the Chicano movement the Chicano Civil Rights Movement. Uh, he took me to my, me and my mom to our first march, and it was around the protest uh, to the war in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. uh, my brother burned his draft card, uh, but he was, uh, he was extremely dedicated to nonviolence tactics. Um, he didn't, you know, he didn't teach us the science or the philosophy, but he was very, very dedicated 
to nonviolence. And he everything that he got involved with was about doing it in a nonviolent way. At the same time, the farm workers, of course, were very, uh, farm worker movement was very active. Dolores Huerta and Cesar Chavez, and they were very much deeply committed. And so we see farm workers, poor people, the poorest of the poor, standing up for their rights in a very powerful way. Uh, even violence, uh, even getting arrested, um, and um, and that seemed to make so much sense. Now, if if they were losing and they were doing that, you might say, well, maybe that's not so. But they were winning. They were building power for people. They were giving voice to poor people through a completely nonviolent way. Mm -hmm. And so, no matter who beat up, who beat them up. No matter if someone was killed on the picket line, they stayed strong and they kept moving forward. The fasting and all the specific tactics, but it was a clear cut, almost a demand that was made on people that you have to do it in a nonviolent strategic way. And that's the way to make change. So those, those I were clearly influences in my life as young as high school. So when I went away to college, I sort of took those as, well, that's the way we're going to do it for as long as I know. And it was true at St. Mary's College. I introduced those same tactics. We fasted. We took over the chapel on the campus. We did a, a lot of things to make the demand. So um, uh, when I met Reverend Lawson, he taught us in a very disciplined, organized way, and we were engaged in activities, in campaigns, in, in real strategy. So this was not a tactic. This was a real strategy to win the first time that I took it uh, to that level yeah. of, of seriousness. And so yeah. Reverend Lawson not only met with our leaders on an ongoing basis, but when we then had all these campaigns and battles, one after another, after another, he was always there to help us understand that battle and how to keep moving forward. There was one particular uh, time that was extremely difficult. We had had a several, several year battle with the Hyatt hotels. Uh, we thought we had done everything possible. We did picket lines inside the hotel. We did picket lines outside. We did strikes. We did uh, uh, took over the lobby and got arrested. So we were at our, our end. We, we just felt like we were not going to be able to move forward in, in any way whatsoever. It was just exhausting, exhausting. And um, so we invited Reverend Lawson and Cesar Chavez to come and speak uh, to the workers. And that was just the most power, one of the most powerful moments in my life for Cesar Chavez, who knew what it meant for the long struggle. You just, and, and he, he talked to them about what farm workers had gone through. And of course, Reverend Lawson did the same thing. The two of you together completely held us up so that we could keep on moving forward and eventually win that fight. It was a pivotal, pivotal moment. And everybody was watching because it was the first uh, campaign under my leadership. So to win it was extraordinarily important. But those were influences that stay with you because stayed with me because it meant winning with a strategy of nonviolence at the core of our campaigns. Thank you, Maria Elena. I remember the Hyatt campaign. I remember those. Uh, picket lines and remember those actions and i remember being with reverend lawson where uh there was a, a room full of latino immigrant workers and uh reverend lawson was the you know uh only you know uh, uh non you know latino uh activist in the room uh and so you know reverend lawson um tell me about uh your uh commitment and your decision to align with this emerging uh, immigrant workers movement of Los Angeles and uh, what made you choose to prioritize that struggle? 
Well, I think mostly it was because Local 11 wanted me to be aligned with them, <laughs> wanted to be, me to connect with them and wanted to engage me as a fellow human being in that struggle. And I'll never forget it. Uh, the, uh, the, the Hyatt, I think uh, the Hyatt uh, big campaign was where at one time we filled up a restaurant with people and we, we were all arrested in it, <laughs> as I recall, all arrested for that effort. Uh, but it was a kinship that developed um, between Maria Elena and her staff and myself, uh, at, at knowing that we could be on the right path to make things change. And of course, my notion anyway is, or was then and it is now, that probably we're not going to get the changes in our country from the top down unless there's a bottom up swelling of campaigns and of actions which demand the common changes that that we required and one of the things that that i uh, appreciate about that this history is that i watched local 11 become a beloved community. One of the most impactful experiences I've had in my lifetime was with, with, with the care and attention and compassion and love that those meetings exemplified again and again, whether in a workshop or whether on the front line. And uh, it confirmed in me the sensibility that uh, millions of us ordinary human beings whose agenda is our families and our friends and our neighbors have much more to say to the governance of Los Angeles and the world than what we know even. Uh, and uh, if what, what we experience and can live out were really known, governments and business would be much different in the way in which we tr treat each other. Um, um, I was thinking of this just the other morning. Uh, I've watched any number of people in the local union who began with Maria Elena back in the mid 80s with us uh, blossom into really remarkable people. <laughs> uh, one or two of them regularly, regularly call me uh, on the phone to talk to me about things and to connect with me again and again and again. Well, thank you for uh, lifting up that tradition of uh, Local 11 in building the beloved community. And yeah, it's one of the things that many activists today need to learn. Um, there have been articles in the paper just this week about some of this. Uh, we don't lead, need to adopt language that despises other people. <laughs> we, we need to concentrate on learning the language of what it is, is to be in kinship with our fellow human beings and to see each other as sisters and brothers and to create local churches and unions that have that sense of, uh, 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 well, in the, in the church sense, not, not so much the sense of salvation, but the sense that we are the children of the universe who are committed to trying to establish the kind of harmony and joy and justice and community where we are that reflects the will of heaven, that reflects on earth <laughs> what God wants us to do through all sorts of teachers and prophets and philosophers and people across every generation, almost millions of years of, of literature. So the, the development of that work is going to be the work that propels the, the nation into a better, into a better society. And, and Reverend Lassen, that, um, was at the core of then our organizing mm -hmm. skills that we had to learn. Just as, a, as an example, 
you're, uh, you know, when our staff, when our organizers go into a workplace where there has a union or not, yeah. right? Yes. You either, yeah. you either, you reach out and you continue to reach out and you continue to reach out yeah. one by one by one. And you engage with each other about your lives, about your aspirations, about your needs, about exactly. your family. And, um, th you know, the other, the other kind of uh, things that some, you know, activists do is to hate you if you don't come on. Yes, yes, you, exactly. And antagonize exactly. you yeah. and go after you exactly. and demonize you because you don't happen to agree with them. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to punish you. And, and that is not a way to grow a powerful movement of people. And exactly. so what you taught us um, was also the smart way of organizing. Yeah. The way that we really are going to uh, build strength is this human connection. And we saw that, I remember distinctly before one of our many uh, 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 civil disobedience actions and you, um, you know, were teaching us in the workshop, getting ready for the arrest. And um, one of the questions was about how did you handle the law enforcement and police when they went to do this? And I remember you told a short story about uh, not becoming over tight friends, but that you somewhat at least a, a kind of a friendship with some in law enforcement, um, somebody in law enforcement that then became, he sort of came to your side, came to our side. And, and that was very eye opening there, you know, when we went to go do these actions, whether it was the law enforcement or whether it was other workers, our job is not to hate them. Mm. Our job is to remind them who they are, who we are, and how much better off we are together. So your 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 teaching yes, that's right. trying to translate them into what do we have to do every single day. Yes, I was uh, uh, reviewing some of this in a history book on uh, the uh, it's uh, 1770, 65 to 1775, the pre-revolutionary war movement in United in the 13 colonies that was essentially a nonviolent movement. We don't need we have enemies for ju against justice, <laughs> enemies who practice racism and male domination and sexism and who practice structured violence and support structured violence. Well, we don't need to add to that group with the methodology. Our task is not to multiply the wrong. Our task is to is to dismantle and dissolve the wrong. And you can't do that by imitating the evil, which of course, Hebrew scripture, Hebrew Christian scriptures, as is the Quran, filled with notions that you cannot overcome evil with evil. You have to overcome evil from an entirely different stance <laughs> and all. So it, it, today, um, there are examples of elected officials nationally being brought to our attention who are <laughs> calling for enmity among us. <laughs> and calling for rejecting various people who live in the United States as human beings or as fellow citizens. A rejecting the notion of the, of the equality of life. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all are created equal. The historical document of the Declaration of Independence. Well, uh, nonviolence is the gathering of the history that says that that is not the way you create a nation, a city, a county, a hospital, a unit, a, a, a union. The, you have to have a sense of we all belong to the same stream of life. And we all have the potential of life in us that it, it is as mysterious to us as it is evident <laughs> in, in our daily life and work. So that we have to appreciate that gift of life and work, therefore, to help people accept their gift in a way that means that they want 
truth and justice. They want a world or a city of beauty. They want a place to live where there is access to all who live there. Uh, they want to overcome the old oppressions and allow new ways of living together and working together and structuring our lives together that will enhance and enrich all of us. Through your guidance and teaching, uh, Reverend Lawson, uh, the work that Maria Elena and Local 11 did uh, was such a breakthrough. You know, I was uh, uh, a staff attorney at SCIU at the time, and we were amazed at how Local 11 was taking the leadership in organizing uh, sit-ins, water-ins, in uh, organizing civil disobedience actions, blocking traffic in downtown Los Angeles, hunger strikes, uh, the largest civil disobedience in history, uh, in Los Angeles history at the LA airport. Uh, this is uh, the work that embraced mm. uh, the philosophy of nonviolence. So, you know, Maria Elena, uh, tell me a little about how this work not only resonated and impacted um, your staff and leaders at Local 11, but indeed, you know, the rest of the LA labor movement. Well, just for a moment, uh, uh, Maria Elena, I remember clearly when the union called for um, our having a university of justice at the intersection of um, Figueroa and exposition on the same day that USC was having its commencement inside the walls where we did a graduate a, gra a graduation for the people who had exemplified the work of justice in the city of Los Angeles. This is, <laughs> I don't remember where that idea came from, but I do remember the day where a number of us were arrested at the University of Justice at the intersection of Figueroa and Exposition. I have fond memories of that action. And before each uh, uh, leader of the hotel workers was taken away and put mm. in the paddy wagon, Reverend Lawson handed them a diploma for yes, justice. That's right. So here inside, <laughs> USC, who was busting the union, who was mistreating their workers. Yes, yes that's right. Yeah. Was happening. And yeah. here on the outside, Reverend Lawson was yeah. presenting to courageous workers who were getting arrested a diploma of justice. So I, I have very fond memories of that. But yeah. Maria Elena, how did this work really impact the rest of the labor movement of Los Angeles? Well, um, fortunately, um, we had Miguel uh, at, the, at the helm of the LA Federation of Labor. And so we were, you know, Miguel grew up, you know, with the farm workers uh, movement. He grew up um, getting arrested with priests and nuns. Uh, you know, he grew up with the tactics of, um, and, and that philosophy. So with him at the helm of the whole labor movement, with us doing what we're doing uh, uh, in our own union, uh, it's, it opened the space to be able to talk about what we were, what did we want to accomplish? How did we want uh, to make things better for, for everybody? And, and it was, in, in our case, it was because the industry is primarily immigrant and, uh, and Latino, we had a place in the labor movement. We could contribute to the labor movement. For many decades, uh, the labor movement had seen both locally and nationally, had, been, had looked at immigrants as uh, not worthy of organizing, as too hard to organize. They're illegals, uh, you know, they take jobs. I mean, sort of the traditional uh, things that were always being said about immigrants. So we were able to show the not only the power that immigrant bring to themselves their own transformation but how they contribute to building power for all of all workers and you we could show that eventually as miguel incorporated uh immigrants into the political movement of los angeles then you really begin to sh get the attention of the rest of the labor movement that oh okay, we can elect better people to city council or to the state. Uh, we can elect better worker-friendly um, electeds because we now have the additional power 
of immigrants who used to be excluded and left out. So I think there were a lot of uh, eye openers for the leaders um, and, and that, that combination of Miguel and us at Local 11, I think just really opened up the doors to a lot more powerful campaigns that everybody saw within reach that, oh, we can do things that we never imagined. You broke the chains of all these traditional ways of organizing and you succeeded. And when you succeed, people pay attention. You know, that, that really matters. And, and we were able to, to succeed. Well, Maria Elena, you know, uh, what you said is exactly true. What Miguel Contreras did, his brilliance was as a political strategist. Mm -hmm. And uh, whereas, you know, the work of uh, Local 11 and other unions in organizing uh, changed the course of history, um, Miguel saw that the best uh, union organizers were also the best political organizers. Mm -hmm. So uh, his work to transform the political landscape in Los Angeles and throughout California uh, has had a lasting impact on, uh, on you know, the future uh, political course uh, of the state. Um, and and so, it, also, you know, it also, you know, um, you know uh, other unions, um, the janitors, uh, Justice for Janitors uh, Union with Mike Garcia, rest in peace, you know, developed the home care workers movement uh, union and campaign developed the the drywall workers and uh, construction uh, developed. I mean, there were a number of uh, a willingness to innovate, willingness to experiment, willingness to put resources into it because we could do it. We could we could absolutely do it. Absolutely. And so uh, the next question was back to Reverend Lawson. Not only were you instrumental in the transformation of uh, uh, nonviolence in, in Local 11, but you were also were instrumental in advising the Justice for Janitors Union, the Home Care Union, uh, the Security Officer Campaign uh, in the philosophy of nonviolence. So can you tell me about that process of how what you were able to do with Local 11 uh, was brought to other unions within the labor movement? Again, almost in invariably um, health, county health care workers, for example, invited me to come and talk with them about nonviolent struggle and about their whole need to, to change the environment of their work as health care workers for the county government of Los Angeles. So in um, um, Mike Garcia was an, another one in the, in the janitors union, how many times we, we met there. So all of it, Took place at, uh, in the same in the same kind of same way that it took place with Local Eleven. Also, the other element of this, I think, is what some historians do call the conversion uh, energy of nonviolent struggle. If you imitate evil, uh, the evil doers have no way of facing their wrong. Everyone thinks they're therefore doing what is right when in fact is hurting them and their situation and their country. The nonviolent practice of being uh, willing to take the hostility but not return it, return it with actions for change with demands for um, improvements, with negotiations that insist upon that, that the old ways are not, uh, are, are causing too many people to suffer in the wrong ways. So there is that conversion process. You don't have a conversion process if you call the enemy all kinds of dirty names like they're calling you. <laughs> <laughs> but to treat them at the level, at the place of negotiations, to treat them with, let the strike do your talking. Let, let the boycott do your talking. Let the picket line do your talking. Let the street demonstrations <laughs> that dramatize our plight and challenge their situation, let direct action 
dramatize the issues that we need the opponents to look at. And invariably, there is going to be a conversion process where people will come over to our side. Uh, I found this in face-to-face -face meetings in the church. You, you, you don't have to go out and make a visit to a visitor to your congregation by telling him what a big sinner he is. <laughs> Let them instead talk about themselves and their family and their own faith journey. <laughs> Let them examine their own questions that they have about where, who they are and where they are and where they want to be. And lo and behold, you discover them coming out on your side of life and your side of faith, apart because of that mysterious process whereby they realize you uh, they realize they are in your camp. <laughs> They're not in the enemy camp. <laughs> they realize you're in the union camp, <laughs> that they are in the union camp. They recognize that their job situation needs addressing. And they who are the worker can help to address that better than almost anybody else. I believe very, very strongly in that principle that at the grassroots levels where people are doing the suffering and the hurting, they have a basic wisdom of living through struggle that can translate <laughs> into the kinds of negotiations and dramas that we can produce that will affect change. And we've seen this in the labor movement in Los Angeles. Uh, uh, labor is, is today not only a strong force in the county of Los Angeles, but the labor movement is, is a strong force that has moved California from its redness, from its hardcore sense of profit and greed, to a sense that there are humanistic things that need to be done that will embrace all the people. To a, one of the important things is the recognition today in California that we have too many children who live in poverty and that they live in a household in California where there's at least one adult working making poverty wages. <laughs> that, that the same moment that the massive, visible, ludicrous wealth is being demonstrated, there are children living in poverty and those children and those families can be given the power to change the situation and make, make California a better state. And that's one of the dynamics that is active in California. That theme, uh, Reverend Lawson, of how uh, workers' victories and workers' struggles inspire other workers' struggles mm -hmm. and other worker victories. Um, I've seen that. And I've seen the work of Local 11 in making a breakthrough at organizing immigrant workers challenge the national labor movement to make a change with regard to their policy on immigration. So it was Unite Here in partnership with the LA County Federation of Labor, in partnership with the farm workers and SEIU and UFCW that fought for and led the change in immigration policy for the national labor movement. And one of the most powerful campaigns that you helped to spearhead, Maria Elena, was the Immigrant Worker Freedom Ride. Mm -hmm. that, uh, uh, went all across the country. So could you tell me about that particular campaign and how in particular it impacted the link between some of the historic freedom struggles in years past, even the term Freedom Ride, Immigrant Worker Freedom Ride, how it linked to that chapter um, of past struggles? Well, because of um, my relationship with Reverend Lawson, we certainly um, learned the the critical role that the nonviolent um, movement has played in this nation, in this country, for everybody. It wasn't about a group in one state. It was about impacting the whole nation, the whole country. And uh, we wanted to, you know, we had just gone through, if you recall, um, September 11th and the attack um, and you know what that did, the trauma that I created in this country. Um, and there was a, a move to use that as a way to turn against people of color, you know, non-whites in this country. 
So uh, that really kind of was at the at the core of what do we do about it? How do we show that really the majority of people in this country are not that way? They don't hate. They don't just wake up and hate uh, other people. They don't just hate African Americans. They don't just hate immigrants. We have to show that side of this country because the opposite was being shown by those in power. So in in talking it through, we decided as a union we wanted to go in that direction uh, and use the freedom ride, the example of the um, uh, Black freedom rides, to uh, w wake up and connect all across the country. Uh, Reverend Lawson uh, was uh, co-national uh, director, chair, and um, Congressman Lewis through his relationship with Congressman Lewis. So the two of them were the, the co-national chairs and led us. It was their credibility, their belief in us, their belief in what we were trying to do that we then developed this over two years it took us to organize across the country, made connections with groups and sectors in our communities that had never really talked and uh, done anything together about changing the immigration laws. Uh, and it wasn't so much, we didn't have a piece of legislation. What we wanted to do was make the connection and across the nation that we were good and immigrants were good people and we're gonna make that, make that point. So um, we did it and um, uh, we, we prepared, we had very intense preparation for uh, uh, how to respond in the case of, of violence against us, in the case of ICE uh, uh, going after us, in the case of um, uh, white supremacist uh, groups uh, attacking us. Um, and Reverend Lawson uh, did several uh, pieces of, of, um, of, of these visits to town after town after town, ended up being 18 uh, busloads of people that went into uh, Washington DC and New York City. Um, but Reverend Lawson went to some of those towns um, and it was quite challenging. And then uh, we were stopped by uh, border patrol agents and held for several hours, um, but um, uh, we had gone through again our training on how to react in that um, and we safely got passed after many hours. Uh, lots of details I won't go into, but the, the bottom line is we helped to change the discourse, the narrative in this country from being so hostile against uh, immigrants um, full of hate we changed and we found what was truly in the hearts of most Americans. And that was that um, uh, immigrants are human beings just like everybody else. Thank you, Maria Elena. And uh, the work that you have done historically with the Immigrant Worker Freedom Ride, with changing the national policy of the AFL-CIO, uh, with organizing immigrant workers, uh, it is having impact today as the national uh, movement for immigration reform is uh, gaining momentum and energy. So we are grateful uh, for that work. Um, the other thing that both of you have done throughout uh, your careers has been uh, building new institutions. And uh, with Maria Elena helping to launch the LA Alliance for New Economy, uh, Reverend Lawson was instrumental in uh, launching the Clergy and Lady United for Economic Justice. So could you tell me, uh, Reverend Lawson, about uh, your um, uh, role and the reason for uh, launching uh, the Clergy and Lady United for Economic Justice. Well, remember, I'm not a. I, I remember mostly. I'm. I my effort has been to be a theologian and a pastor, a, a person of trying to follow Jesus. And on the one side, there is powerful uh, scriptural. Um, um, uh, motivation for connecting economic justice with the spiritual life <laughs> uh, as essential. Um, and um, there are two texts that come to my mind very quickly from Jesus of Sirach, um, who was a Jewish teacher 180 years before Jesus of Nazareth. 
uh, in a big book that's called Ecclesia Ecclesiasticus. It's not a part of the Hebrew Bible, but I think any of us who are students of the Hebrew Bible and the Christian Bible know this book. Um, it should actually be in the Bible. I've been meaning to investigate why it's not. But in any case, Jesus of Sirach says that when you deprive a worker of their wages, it's murder. <laughs> That's in the 35th chapter, the 36th verse, I recall, of the book of Ecclesiasticus, or the book of Sirach, Jesus of Sirach. And then Jesus says uh, two or three times in the books of his life um, that the laborer deserves his wages. Um, so, in fact, I use those texts when I, in fact, um, uh, called for a meeting at Holman Church of clergy and union people, out of which then we organize clergy and laity united for economic justice, what we call in Los Angeles clue. Um, and the main, the main part of that is about pastors of congregations being aware of what their, congreg their congregants have to go through in daily life in order to sustain themselves and keep themselves. And so that the work they do is critical to the well-being of the congregation as well as critical to the, to the life of working people. So CLUE is our effort to call upon the religious community at the local level to do the work that abolishes poverty. Do the work that gets rid of poverty wages for people who are working people do the work that makes work unhealthy for millions of people. The Poor People's Campaign nationally says that 140 million people in the United States have a constant wrestling match just to have food and shelter and medical attention and jobs and, and transportation. So the United States has bragged so much about its wealth and technological skills that we have forgotten to apply that to all the people of our in our nation. So uh, uh, I I maintain that that uh, the mission of the church includes the most serious examination of the meaning of community the meaning of the beloved community, the meaning of economic justice and how people sustain their lives. Thank you. Um, and uh, the work that you've done to launch the Clergy and Lady United for Economic Justice has been so powerful in uh, building this alliance and uh, in lifting up uh, the faith community in such a meaningful way. Uh, I, know, I know our time is almost up, but uh, uh, Maria Elena, uh, the building behind me has, actually has quite historic significance for you. You got your start there as an organizer uh, with the Garment Workers Union. Um, the campaign to elect you as president of Local 11 took place uh, right. more than 30 years ago in the building uh, behind us. Uh, the, the training, a nonviolence training for the immigrant worker freedom ride took place in the building mm -hmm. behind us. That's right. <laughs> and uh, yeah. both of you joined us for the launch of Dream Summer 10 years ago. Yeah, uh, it helped to uh, build a new uh, immigrant youth movement, not only here in Los Angeles, but across the country. And so um, I know that you have a, a current proposal with regard to the building behind me. So I wonder if you could share me share with me what that proposal is. Well, since uh, I have the um, privilege of being chair of one of the budget Senate budget subcommittees, um, I have proposed and we all are working very hard, Kent and Larry and uh, so many uh, people working very hard uh, to reach our dream. And our dream is to open um, and reconfigure 
in a much bigger way, the Reverend James Lawson Worker Justice Center. There, this, this is a, a small token of the recognition uh, that Reverend Lawson deserves for having taught us, te continues to teach us for so many years what we need, what workers need, a center of innovation, a center where workers feel free uh, with, you know, college students feel free to walk through those doors and learn about contributing to building a movement, can learn about uh, how you contribute to the justice movement. And nobody connects these dots, as Reverend Lawson used to remind me, connect the dots. Nobody connects these dots better than Reverend James Lawson. So we're working hard. We're working hard to make sure that we reach our dream, our, our next dream uh, by, by doing this project. Well, thank you for that announcement. We are looking forward to the day of having a permanent institution uh, named in honor of uh, Reverend James Lawson Jr. Uh, that will be forever a powerful source of uh, meeting of nonviolent strategy and tactics and advancing a social change ag agenda. So uh, thank you, Senator Maria Elena Dorazo for your support for that. And we hope to realize our dream very soon. Thank you, Reverend Lawson. Thank I love you, you very so much. much. Right. Love you so much. It, thank is you for... it is a mutual love, my friend. And um, thank you for love. all yeah. your personal support yeah. and, uh, and your teachings. Thank you, Kent. Uh, thank you, for... Maria Elena. Yeah. This, this is very good for my for my soul to be able to uh, have this conversation. Yeah, same for mine. That's right. Because we've been connected for 30 years, since the 1980s, at <laughs> least. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> it, is, it has helped sustain we'll the struggle, sustain. and it's been a great experience, <laughs> a, great part, a great part of life. Oh, there's so many other things. We need a, several more hours, Reverend Loss. Yeah. <laughs> We, we, yeah. we will schedule that in the future. But thank you so much, Maria Elena. Thank you so much, Reverend Lawson. Uh, next week, our thank next you, week will be Reverend Alan yeah. Bosak from South Africa. Okay, class, have a good afternoon. Thank you.